Welcome to Naked Reflections, brought to you from the Wolf Institute. I'm Ed Kessler, and each week I'll be taking an in-depth look at the stories reported by our friends over at The Naked Scientists. What does the latest scientific stuff mean for the rest of us? Stay with us and find out. The party political leaflets that drop through my letterbox look as if they were designed in the 1950s and read like messages from a forgotten era. On the other hand, we hear of the ruthless targeting of voters via social media, courtesy of algorithms, of course, derived from focus group discussions. It's sometimes tempting to think that the gap between these two extremes is precisely where civilized and purposeful political engagement should be taking place. To coin a phrase, we're talking politics this week on Naked Reflections. Local and mayoral elections in England are accompanied by parliamentary elections in Scotland and Wales at a time when the UK Union is under strain. Liberal democracy seems to be on the retreat worldwide. Plenty at stake then. But given the question adapted from Abraham Lincoln, do elections still belong to the people? Perhaps it's as well to remind ourselves that democracy has always been a fragile concept and just get on and bite the ballot. As usual, we bring a bit of science to the table, and in this case, behavioural science. Here's Dan Bang of University College London on the Naked Scientist show, Are You Sure You Made the Right Choice? You can say that the general vote uh, tends to prefer confident people. We want to know that those people who are in charge know what they're doing. But that sort of introduces a different incentive scheme, if you like, for confidence, such that if you're a politician, you might realise that even though you have doubt about a certain policy or or certain plan for, for, for government, then it's going to be in your interest to have overconfidence in that policy or in that plan, because you know that that's going to turn into some political currency for you. It just really highlights the social aspect of confidence when you get to the, this larger political scale. My guests this week are David Runciman, Professor of Politics at the University of Cambridge and presenter of the influential podcast Talking Politics, and the diplomat turned academic Catherine Arnold, who served as UK ambassador in Mongolia, amongst other places, and who's currently master of that exotic and far-flung territory, St Edmunds College, Cambridge. David, should we voters hold up our hands and take the blame for voting for politicians with the wrong sort of confidence? So I think it's a bit harsh when people say we get the politicians we deserve, because I think they are largely to blame for a lot of things. But I do feel for them in that we blame them for things that they had to do in order to persuade us to vote for them. A lot of the hypocrisy is on us, but I do also think that elections are an incredibly crude way. I mean, they are the essence of democracy, and I'm definitely not in favour of democracy without elections. So when people say that elections are crude, it sometimes sounds like I want to abolish them, I don't. But they are an incredibly crude way of finding out what people think. And we shouldn't be surprised that this crude device produces this mismatch between our expectations and how the politicians behave. And the most obvious example of that is, I mean, it's a cliche, but campaigning is not governing. And you campaign to win votes, and then you're judged on how you govern. And the idea that we should be surprised that there's a gap between those two things, that is on us. We shouldn't be so naive. Well, Catherine, is there anything that David said that's uh, irrelevant to your experience in the diplomatic corps? I would really very much agree with what David was saying. I mean, I think particularly when we look at politics in a world in which access to information has become simultaneously easier and harder over the last 20 years than arguably previously, politics is even more about reconciling the specific with the generic. And particularly as we are campaigning more and more on issues, as you said at the start, that come out of focus groups, which can often be very specific in order to tilt the vote towards um, a particular political party. And then yet when one has to govern, one has to govern much more for the generic, i.e. a larger number of people. I think it's unsurprising that we have many of the tensions that we see and the mismatches that we perceive between um, the rhetoric on a campaign and then the reality of government. Well, let's get down to specifics, Catherine. You're hell of a college. I mean, what's your experience of student engagement with politics? A lot of student engagement at the moment appears to be focused around the experience of different groups, whether we're talking about genders, whether we're talking about ethnicity, 
And there does seem to be a moment that we're going through in which there is a generational shift. How much that is coming out of the fact that we have students now who have only ever lived in a digital and online world versus those of us who are pre-digital in different ways, I think is something that I'd love to hear um, David's thoughts on. And I think it was to some extent summed up in the discussion around the New York Times last year. And I think Barry Weiss very eloquently set out on Twitter what she felt that was about, which is the famous um, phrase of the New York Times, all the news that's fit to print. And she posited that somewhere around the age of 40, we have an intergenerational divide between liberals who are over 40 and focus in that phrase on the all. So all the news that's fit to print and liberals, as they identify themselves under the age of 40, who would focus on the fit all the news that's fit to print. And although it's a um, it's a very short, pithy description, I think it says an awful lot about where some of the, the tensions and the politicisation of student debate might lie at the moment. But I'd love to hear what David thinks about that. So I remember distinctly to the point that, you know, student interest in politics is always there, but it's sort of more visible at various times. During the, the Blair years, when I started teaching politics, it was hard to get students to kind of connect studying politics and politics. And then the Iraq war just changed everything. That was the moment when I first thought it's chalk and cheese, the moments of engagement are not. And this is much more like that. Um, I mean, I think we're currently living through a period where the level of engagement is very high, no question, on a whole range of issues. I was doing an online panel for Youth UK, Youth Vote UK the other night, and the intensity is really overwhelming. <laughs> People are angry and people are vocal. But the thing that I think has changed, and I do bang on about this on my podcast probably a bit too much, but I think it really does matter when you're thinking about generational shifts, is the demographics here. Um, because I'm certain that part of the frustration comes from the fact that for the first time in the history of democracy, young people are not just disadvantaged because you know, MPs are older and people with money and power are older. They are outnumbered. We live in these ageing societies in which there are more people aged 50, 60, 70 and 80 than there are people aged 20, 30 and 40. And if you look at electoral politics, the generation divide is stark in the last British in the general election. If people under 30 had been the electorate, Corbyn would have won the biggest landslide in the history of this country. If people over 60 had been the electorate, the Tories would have won every seat, bar about three, I think. It's two nations. It's the Israelis, two nations. But the difference is that traditionally, old people had the money and the power and the influence because they were outnumbered. <laughs> and young people, if they could mobilize, would win. Now, if younger people mobilize, they still lose. When you talk to students, they say we're completely politically engaged, but you keep trying to funnel our engagement through your old fashioned, old style representative democracy. And I'm on their side when they say there've got to be other ways of doing democracy than this. You see, what you've said, David, echoes a question that's come in from one of our students, which I didn't share with you beforehand, but you've touched on it, so I'm going I'm to raise it now. Ellie asks, I've wanted to know why protests have been so rarely successful in the UK. Look at France. Protests can halt a country, a government, but in the UK, even the most popular protest, which was the Iraq war, didn't make any difference. Even Black Lives Matter protests, although influential, doesn't seem to have made much of a difference other than another report on race which says there's no structural racism. Why don't protests in the UK lead to political change? I mean, is that a bigger issue, David, than the generational one? I mean, it's a really good question. And I don't think it's completely straightforward. So France is, is at one end of the spectrum on this. The French have a tradition. <laughs> you know, and French politicians almost have a re sort of Pavlovian reflex when people come out on the streets. Um, I don't think it's typical. And I'll throw that example in the United States, but in other countries too. But the Iraq war protest is a good example. My memory, roughly 2 million people. And it wasn't just the protest. You know, there was a massive public scepticism. And the government ran roughshod over that. It's partly our electoral system that governments in the House of Commons are relatively untouchable. I mean, we are a particular kind of polity in that respect. Our governments are less accountable in many ways than under other electoral systems. It's partly a question of tradition, but I also think that one shouldn't jump to the conclusion that when a protest happens and the government doesn't do what the protesters want, that it has failed. These things play out over the long term so, for instance, I think it's far too soon to judge the impact of Black Lives Matter. 
um, I think that could take a long time. And you know, the classic example of this, I don't want to sound like a crusty old historian, but the classic example of this is the 1848 revolutions. And though that seems like a long time ago, I think it's relevant here. Two, three, four, five years on from the 1848 revolutions, which swept Europe, the classic street protest, they had failed. 20, 30, 40, 50 years on, they had democratized Europe. So I would say to Ellie, don't give up yet. I wonder how much as well, though, David, to focusing on the Iraq war, it was partly because it was an international event rather than a domestic piece of domestic politics. And the difference perhaps that you saw between something like the poll tax demonstrations, which did have a domestic political impact, and something like the Iraq war, you know, did the did the government feel partly to do with our electoral system, as you've said, but did the government feel that it could afford to lose on Iraq, because really, it wasn't going to change people's votes? So, so the poll tax is a good example. And again, I'm not saying that this means that you should make your protest violent. But the poll tax protest eventually became violent. And that's very different for governments than a peaceful protest of 2 million people, I think. It was also, um, as Catherine said, it, you know, the electoral consequences were stark. You know, Tory governments will change if they think they're going to lose an election. It doesn't matter how they discover that fact. And the poll tax looked like it might cost them the election. But the international thing is interesting because after all, in the Vietnam War, I, you know, this is before my time, but protest did matter. And there were choices. I mean, Blair did not have to. The, the, the war would have happened in the same way that Britain couldn't stop the Vietnam War. But the protest was against Britain's involvement. And that was entirely at the discretion of the UK government. And the fact that that didn't even touch the sides. You know, Blair was in from the beginning. And it seems like no aspect of public opinion was going to dissuade him. That, to me, is the thing that's hardest to explain. Let's move into a different uh, space. David, you touched on the sort of generational gap and the fact that the, the younger generation don't seem to have the influence politically this time for the first time. So therefore, we need to change our politics. Now, you've talked a little bit about how we might radically change our politics. Give us some suggestions. So the one that I make when I'm asked this question now, because I'm committed to it, though it horrifies people, is um, I think we should lower the voting age, the figure I've arrived at is to six, not 16. That is, I think children should vote. And, and I partly make that argument, it is a provocation, but in order to suggest to people that one of the oddities, I think, of our attitude to democracy is we're so worried about it, we're sort of often convinced we're on the brink of a retreat back to authoritarianism or fascism. It's, it's all about to fall apart. And yet we think we can't alter it. You know, it's sort of untouchable. And the arguments that I hear against votes for children aren't that different from the arguments that people made against votes for women, votes for the poor, votes for Catholics, votes for Jews. People get very wound up. And then were, were we to do that? Well, say we were to say that anyone who goes to school can vote because there are lots of reasons why we might do it. One of which is you know, it's their future. Another of which is we don't ask adults to qualify when people say, well, children aren't well informed enough, well, nor are most adults, nor are most of us. Most of us on most questions haven't got a clue, and I include myself in that. It wouldn't change that much, but it would reinvigorate, it would open up, it would challenge. I think if politicians had to go and um, tap for votes in schools, they would behave better, not worse. There are all sorts of things that might follow from that. It would be an experiment. It might be dramatic. It might might be surprising. Maybe six-year-olds are very conservative. I, haven't, I don't know. I don't think they get polled very often. But what really interests me is people's horror at the idea, absolute horror. People either laugh or they scream when I suggest that primary age children should vote. I mean, I go into schools sometimes and talk about this. And frankly, I think if politicians were in primary schools, the quality of political debate would probably be better than it is on Question Time on the BBC. And yet people react to this as though I've said we should just sort of set fire to the whole thing and burn the house down. So I, I use that as an illustration just to suggest that we are remarkably small c conservative about our democracy. People react similarly to citizens' assemblies, all sorts of things, street politics. And yet we also seem to think the world's about to come to an end. And I just think we should make our minds up. If the world's about to come to an end and our democracy is falling apart, let's try something different. Religion, of course, would be quite happy to bring the voting age down to you know, 12, 13, 14, because, of course, in olden days, that was an age of maturity. Um, Catherine, how would you feel whether it's six, as David's suggesting, or 13, as I'm suggesting? 
I think it's a really interesting idea, not one that I've reflected on a lot. I think there are a lot more of the argument that I've heard, and I should say that I don't have a firm personal view on this, is curtailing voting at the other end. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not testing that, but I think it is an interesting thought experiment because one of the challenges that is often put forward about democracy from countries where there perhaps is less democracy is the fact that it is quite short termist, the false incentives that a democratic cycle puts upon those who are governing. It is an argument that comes up quite a lot because after all, we don't test people for their competence. And so you know, in an ageing society, almost by definition, if we think that there is a competence level required to vote, we allow the vote for many people who, for whatever reasons, can't. And that's fine. And I think it's completely fine because I think there are some basic democratic principles, one of which is one person, one vote. And another of which is I think we've learned that tests for voting are not a good idea. So when people say this and I say, OK, fine, so are you going to go into the care homes and are you going to, how are you going to do it? When, where and how are you going to do this? Or if you're just going to pick an arbitrary age like 75, you deal with the protests of the 76 year olds from whom you've just taken away the vote. Taking away the vote from people is a catastrophic idea. Giving the vote to people is a great idea, just as a basic sort of. And yet it's odd how when it comes to children and older voters, people tend to sort of flip it the other way around. I mean, there are certain democratic principles that have held up really well. And one of which is, if there are more people to enfranchise, you should think, is there a good reason not to do it? You're listening to Naked Reflections with me, Ed Kessler, and my guests this week, David Runciman and Catherine Arnold. In some ways, the plumbing of political discourse doesn't seem to have changed much at all. In others, it's been transformed. Here's Sander van der Linden speaking on the Naked Scientist podcast, Optogenetics, lighting up the brain. You know, one of the things that I'm really interested in is what I call the psychology of consensus. And so we, we, we tend to pay attention to consensus in a lot of domains. One is the social domain. And so the way it works is that when something, whereas there's an implicit consensus or social proof that something is important, we, we tend to um, interact with it without deeply thinking about it. So if something's been shared a million times and a video has been viewed, you know, two million times, um, people simply share it without thinking. And so I think just because it's attractive and it signals to people this must be important because everyone's paying attention to it and that sort of creates a self-sustaining mechanism where something gets shared much like a virus it gets replicated at a very high rate and at that at that rate it might overturn the uh, the, the rate of actual news many of our discussions on naked reflection seem to turn on the power of social media i hesitate to ask because none of us are spring chickens but is this a way of getting young people more engaged with politics I certainly notice that there is a period in which school focuses children's minds or young people's minds on very particular issues and almost gives them more space to think through the ideology, the theory behind an issue. And then very crudely, life hits and we become more worried about how we commute, when we're going to see our friends and whether we can pay the mortgage. And so there are certain big issues that one might argue, and David, again, I'd love to know if you've got any more detail on this, that younger people have more space to think about how they will affect them and the longer term trends and effects they might have on society than once we leave school or indeed leave university. It's a really good question. I don't think we really know the answer. I mean, these things are always hard to pick out from polling data anyway, but why on some issues there are these big generational gaps. But I do tend to, you know, instinctively, I feel there's got to be something in that, that there is a space as well as it's not simply that the grumpy old person's view that young people can adopt attitudes without having to pay the price for them. It's amazing how if you push people, how quickly you can force them to say when they say why children shouldn't vote, that they think that voting should be limited to people who pay tax, for instance. And then you point out to them, well, really, you know, you again, you try that in a, in a 21st century society that you're sounding like a 19th century aristocrat. And so I think it is possible that there is more space. And that's in a way the thing that we're looking for. After all, the thing that we feel that we've lost most in our politics is space to open questions up. Questions seem to close down, even online, even in the place where everything is meant to be most open. The arguments are, if anything, even more sort of pinched by immediacy and certainty. And though children are often certain about some things, what we do know educationally, psychologically, is that children are much more curious than adults. And curiosity is also a part of democratic politics, a kind of sense that the future might be radically different from the present. And somehow to 
to sort of exclude that on the grounds that it might be dangerous seems to me to be absurd. Should we also be focusing on local politics? Because the numbers who vote nationally are far greater than those who vote locally. But yet local politics can work very well. I think it was Cameron who went in for localism and and the big society. And did the local mayors start under David Cameron? Is that the way forward? Is the trend towards local politics? Certainly, I think there's much more scope for different levels. I mean, not only are we fixated on elections everywhere, people fixate on national elections. They are the sort of the big horse race of democratic politics. And so much of what happens politically happens at other levels than that, both internationally and also locally. But in Britain, it's always been a real challenge. We do live in a very centralised state. And you know, experiments are had in local politics, like police commissioners, and then people don't vote. And the reason people don't vote is they don't believe it actually matters. And it becomes a kind of vicious circle. Then the argument is, well, they don't care enough. And so the powers go back to the centre. But there have been changes. I think mayors have changed things. But the big change has been devolution. I mean, the big change and, in a way, challenge to our politics now is having devolved Westminster politics to the constituent parts of the UK. And I think particularly under the pandemic, there's much more awareness now that certain kinds of decisions are better taken away from Westminster. So whether that means in Edinburgh Cardiff or whether it means local track and trace working better, local health decisions happening better, even the success of the vaccine rollout, a centralised thing, but it's so dependent on people's connections with local institutions. I know that's not what this podcast is about, but I do suspect in the medium term, what's happened in the last year is going to have a profound impact on how people think about democratic politics and where it should happen. I think that goes back to that underpinning question, which is how do you turn the specific of 70 million people, I mean, obviously not 70 million voters, but millions of people into a generic, which can actually be a framework through which you govern. And I think at different times, we see uh, an ebb and flow towards centralisation and then um, a response to that and towards localisation. But I think it is an incredibly pressing question. As Countries around the world get to a point within their democratic journey that more and more people are actively engaged or believe they should be actively engaged in their politics. And I certainly found in Mongolia that it was quite interesting to see some of the democratic experiments that they were doing there. Um, It's a country, just for context, that had been a democracy when I first went there for around 26 years, so a very young democracy, with many of the institutions that we take for granted that undergird our democracy still being very young. It also only has three million people, even though it's a country the size of Western Europe. So that presents democratic opportunities as well as democratic problems. But they were looking at some of the fundamental problems of how do you actually engage the population in major infrastructure and other funding decisions when you have very finite resources? This is a lower middle income country between the electoral cycle, which is only every four years. And they were working very closely, for example, with the Deliberative Polling Institute within Stanford University, conceived by Professor James Fishkin, which very crudely aimed to take groups of people of around 400, baseline poll them on what their thought on was a particular issue, spend a weekend with the opportunity to engage with experts, uh, with people who had very polarised views on the issue, and then at the end of that weekend, poll them again to see which way they would then vote. And then the difference between that baseline poll and that more educated decision was seen as a proxy for how the country as a whole might have responded to that issue had the country as a whole had the opportunity to be better informed on it. And of course, that whole system is predicated on concept they call of rational ignorance, that it is rational for most voters not to want to be incredibly well informed on every single issue. And yet at the same time, we also want to participate in the direction of travel of our government. I was aware when people talk about these experiments in deliberation, Vancouver is one place they cite, but Mongolia is often the other. I mean, it's interesting the different places in which this happens. And I absolutely agree. Democracy between elections is the thing that we neglect. I mean, elections happen you know, overnight, and then you have four years. And there are lots of other things that we could do. And it partly gets to that question about local politics. I mean, one of the problems is we model local politics on national electoral politics. One of the reasons it's harder to get people to turn out to vote is that elections work better as a kind of grand national spectacle. But there are so many other ways of engaging people in politics, and we don't do enough of them. Is this country where religion can play a role? You've been in parts of the world where religion plays a a key role in the political establishment 
And research in the UK shows that higher religious observance equates to higher voting turnout. So first of all, Catherine, what role do religious leaders play where you have experience? And David, is it uh, politically incorrect to say religious leaders should have a greater role in British politics? I mean, that's a massive question. If we allow we're in a democratic space, can religious leaders play a role in helping shape that democracy, then I think the answer has to be yes. Whether that is at the level of how uh, people might vote on particular issues, that religious leaders definitely have an influence on that around the world, all the way through to mobilising people who vote. When you consider that religions can speak to people who politicians cannot, um, I think they are and can be a very powerful motivation for electorates to engage. I think we should be wary of equating high vote to turnout with the health of a democracy. I mean, I think that's one of the sort of traps that we fall into. Well, there are a couple of classic examples, one of which was Weimar democracy, where turnout was incredibly high, not because it was a strong democracy, but because it was weak and people were terrified that the other side would win when the stakes are too high. But another place that was true was Iraq after the 2003 war, where Democracy was introduced and voter turnout was through the roof, 80%, 90%. Not because this was a healthy, vibrant democracy, but because it was such a divided society, including on religious lines, that depending what community you belong to, everybody would vote in a desperate attempt to stop the other side from winning because no one believed if the other side won that they would get a fair turn. I have to say I'm agnostic on the question of whether there's more space for forms of religious or faith-based leadership But at the same time, there ought to be all sorts of ways in for people who aren't centrally political figures, but who aren't just there sort of influencing on the edges and and who have a voice. But I wouldn't limit that to religious leaders. You know, I think we're always surprised by who suddenly turns out to have a voice. And to go back to the question you asked earlier about the futility of street protest, a, a young girl standing outside of school and saying, I won't go to school is now one of the most important public figures in the world. And she does channel something to some people which is cultish and also to other people has a kind of religious quality to it. You never know where that's that's going to come from. The last thing I'll say, one of my favourite books is a book about 1979, which said, if you ask people in 1975 who were going to be the most important people in the world in five years' time, no one would guess it was going to be Deng Xiaoping, Ayatollah Khomeini, Margaret Thatcher, and the Pope, the soon-to-be Pope, John Paul. You never know. Those four people in 1975 were all languishing in obscurity. You know, the Bishop of Krakow was going to become a world historic figure. Ayatollah Khomeini in exile was going to become a world historic figure. Margaret Thatcher, a failed education secretary, was going to become a world historic figure. Religion is there in that mix, but religion is not the explanation of that. The explanation of that is history is very weird. If I could just pick up on one of the points that David made, I think having spent a lot of my life overseas, one of the things that I think is incredible when I come back to the UK and vote is how I walk into a polling booth. And I believe, I don't know whether this is true or not, but I believe I can look at people from all walks of life and I have no idea which way they're going to vote. Whereas in too many countries that I've lived in, you can walk into a polling booth and most of the people in that booth will have a pretty good idea how the other people in that booth will have voted because they will have voted along ethnic lines, they'll have voted along religious lines, they'll have voted along class lines. Now, I'm not saying that we don't have some of that in in the UK, but I think there is something very powerful about a democracy in which it is less obvious which way you will have voted because it means that we can speak across these divides. And in some way, for me, the power of democracy is the ability to speak across divisions. There we must end it. Thank you for listening. And thanks to my guests, David Runciman and Catherine Arnold for their contributions and, given the subject, for listening to each other. Let's be hearing from you at Naked Reflections. You can contact us at the Wolf Institute by email or on Twitter or Facebook. Let us know what you think of the show. We'd like to think we get your vote. You can catch up with all our subjects that we've covered by delving into our back catalogue, and it's worth checking out our new podcast, The A to Z of the Holy Land, from Arab to Zion, all you need to know about the Holy Land in bite-sized chunks. You can also find the Naked Reflections podcast at nakedscientists.com slash reflections or wherever you access your podcasts. I'll be back next week with some more guests.